In Unit 3, Lecture 4, Part 4, we're going to continue on with our discussion of bacterial exotoxins, looking at our final group, type 3 toxins, toxins that interfere with host cell function. Don't forget to look over your fundamental statements at the beginning of this soft chalk lesson and, of course, learn the detailed learning objectives so you'll be ready for the Unit 3 exam. <clears throat> Keep in mind on the three soft chalk lessons on exotoxins, you're only responsible for the toxins listed in the detailed learning objectives. And if I give you a description of the toxin, you should be able to indicate whether it's a type one, type two, or type three toxin and match it up with the name of the organism that produces that toxin. So as we mentioned, type three toxins, sometimes called AB toxins, uh, but these are basically toxins that interfere with host cell function. And they got the name AB toxins because uh, when they were first discovered, it was known they had two distinct parts, an A and a B portion. The A stands for the active component, and that enzymatically it activates some host cell intracellular target or signaling pathway to interfere with host function. That's the active portion or A portion. The B stands for the binding component, and that's the portion that binds the exotoxin to receptor molecules on the surface of the host cell membrane. And of course, then determines the type of host cell in which that toxin is able to affect. So as we see in figures one and two, the binding portion is the portion that has a shape that fits a receptor on the host cell membrane and determines if that toxin can affect that cell. And then the active component is the part that actually causes harm and interferes with the host cell function. Once the toxin binds, then the uh, active portion enters the host cell, either through translocation or endocytosis, as shown in figures three and four. Now, many of these active portions of AB toxins have a similar action, although not all of them work this way. Uh, many of them remove an ADP ribosyl group from the coenzyme NAD and covalently attach that ADP ribosyl group to some host cell protein. And that process is called ADP ribosylation, which is shown in figure five. So NAD, remember, is a coenzyme that carries hydrogen to the electron transport chain during the electron transport system. And on the left, we see the structure of NAD. Well, what happens with AB toxins when they're causing ADP ribosylation is that NAD is cleaved where the dotted line is. And it takes this large ADP ribosyl group down here and attaches that to some target protein in a cell. And once this ADP ribosyl group attaches to a target protein, it typically alters the shape of that protein, rendering it non-functional and thus interfering with some function of that host cell. Now remember our body's major defense against these exotoxins is to produce antitoxin antibodies like we mentioned in our overview to exotoxins. So again pretty much all of the toxins uh, especially the type 2 type 3 toxins bind to a host cell by a binding component and that has a molecular shape that fits some receptor on a host cell. And once the binding compulsion binds, then the red active portion in this case can enter the host cell and cause, interfere with some host cell function. So our defense against those toxins would be to make antibodies that fit the binding portion during humoral immunity where the FAB or antigen binding fragment of the antibody is tailor-made to fit the binding component of the toxin. And if the antibody can bind to the exotoxin before the exotoxin binds to the host cell, that blocks the binding of the toxin to the host cell and winds up neutralizing that exotoxin. And so when we immunize against diphtheria and against tetanus, we're actually injecting a toxoid a harmless form of the exotoxin to teach the body how to make these antibodies against the binding component. So that if that bacterium producing the toxin or the toxin ever gets into the body, the antibodies can rapidly be produced and neutralize it before it can bind to host cells and cause damage. <clears throat> 
So we're going to look at a number of examples of uh, AB toxins and other similar toxins that interfere with host cell function. Again, you're only responsible for the ones listed in the detailed learning objectives. Uh, one we've known about for a long time is the diphtheria exotoxin produced by the bacterium Carinobacterium diphtheriae, uh, which causes diphtheria spread by the respiratory route. And this toxin interferes with host cell protein synthesis. It causes ADP ribosylation of a host cell elongation factor 2, or EF2. You don't have to know the specifics of this, but that's what it binds to. And this elongation factor is necessary for transfer RNA to insert new amino acids in the growing protein chain. So if the elongation factor 2 is inactivated by the ADP ribosylation, uh, that prevents the cell from making proteins and results in cell death. Initially, the cells in the throat are killed by the toxin, uh, but if the toxin is released into the blood, it can damage internal organs and lead to organ failure. And before the days of immunization, this is a very common cause of morbidity and mortality in children. It wasn't unusual for children to die of diphtheria. So today we prevent that through immunization. The D part of the DTP vaccine, which stands for diphtheria tetanus pertussis, contains diphtheria toxoid. And a toxoid uh, is an exotoxin that's been made non-poisonous, but still stimulates the production of antitoxin antibodies. It allows the body to make antibodies against the binding part of the diphtheria toxoid. And once the antibody binds to the exotoxin, the toxin can no longer bind to receptors of the host cell and can no longer cause harm. The cholera exotoxin, known as cholerogen, is produced by Vibrio cholera, the bacterium that causes cholera, another fecal oral root disease. And this toxin causes ADP ribosylation of a host cell protein called GS. And this turns the synthesis of a metabolic regulator molecule called cyclic AMP on and off. So what happens in this case is that uh, once you have ADP ribosylation of this GS protein, it's inactivated, then synthesis of cyclic AMP stays turned on. And when you have high levels of cyclic AMP, this blocks intestinal epithelial cells from taking in sodium from the lumen of the intestines and stimulates the secretion of large quantities of chloride from these cells. So basically sodium and chloride are solved accumulate in the lumen of the intestine and osmotically water follows. And this causes loss of fluids, diarrhea, and severe and even sometimes fatal dehydration. We have a little movie here of the cholera toxin uh, being produced by Vibrio cholera and the effects on a cell. So we'll load that in. So here's the epithelial cells. There's a Vibrio cholera. And when the toxin is injected and causes ADP ribosylation of the GS protein, uh, sodium is not taken up by the cells. Chlorium is excreted. And notice as the sodium and chloride accumulate out here in the lumen, uh, the cells are able to uh, show dehydration. So again, if we watch this, we'll notice as the water leaves the cell, the cell shrinks. And of course, the blood tries to restore the fluid to the cells, but then that leads to the lumen. The blood tries to restore the fluid, and eventually, uh, large amounts of fluid can be lost. And in fact, in fulment cases of cholera, the very severe cases, Sometimes people can lease up to two liters of fluid in an hour from diarrhea and can actually cause uh, die from dehydration. So the treatment for this is uh, drinking clean water that's not contaminated, you're giving clean water with electrolytes. Entrotoxins are, uh, some of the entrotoxins are also AB toxins. A number of bacteria produce exotoxins, and any toxin that binds to the cells of the small intestines are called enterotoxin. Entero, remember, means intestinal. So most of these toxins catalyze the ADP ribosylation of host cell proteins, 
that affects synthesis of the regulator molecules, either cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, uh, turning it on or off. And when you have high levels of cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, like with the cholera toxin, this causes loss of electrolytes in water, resulting in diarrhea. So technically, the cholera toxin we just looked at is an enterotoxin, but because it is so unique and it is rather potent toxin, uh, we usually consider that separately. But there's a number of organisms that produce enterotoxins that affect cyclic AMP levels, including Clostridium perfringens. In addition to causing gas gangrene, it can cause a food poisoning, as can a soil bacterium, Bacillus cereus. Now also uh, some type one toxins like Staphylococcus aureus enterotoxin and enterotoxigenic E. coli produce enterotoxins, but these are, are type one toxins that activate high levels of T4 lymphocytes rather than causing ADP ribosylation of cells. But any toxin that affects the intestines is technically an enterotoxin. Pertussis and exotoxins caused by Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella pertussis causes whooping cough and spread by the respiratory route. Pertussis is the actual name of the disease. And the pertussis exotoxin causes ADP ribosylation of a host cell protein called GI, which like the enterotoxins we mentioned leads to high levels of cyclic AMP, but now in the respiratory tract and that disrupts cellular function in the respiratory tract. In the respiratory epithelium, high levels of cyclic AMP result in increased respiratory secretions and mucus production and contribute greatly to the coughing associated with whooping cough or pertussis. Uh, excessive cyclic AMP also decreases phagocytic activity, things like chemotaxis, engulfment, and killing. And in the blood, um, the pertussis toxin can increase sensitivity to histamine, which can increase capillary permeability and uh, contribute to hypotension and shock. It can also act on neurons, sometimes causing encephalopathy. Uh, Pseudomonas rigenosa produces a variety of type 2 toxins we mentioned in the previous lesson and some type 3 toxins. Exotoxin A interferes with whole cell protein synthesis by causing ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two, uh, would get, which again is necessary for normal protein synthesis. It also appears to be immunosuppressive. And exotoxin S also inhibits whole cell protein synthesis, leading to tissue damage and is immunosuppressive. Shiga toxin produced by species of Shigella, as well as Shiga toxin producing Escherichia coli what we call STEC, bacteria like E. coli uh, 0157H7. And these are the bad E. coli you hear about occasionally in the news. Uh, this toxin is an AB toxin that cleaves host cell ribosomal RNA and prevents the attachment of charge transfer RNAs and thus blocks host cell protein synthesis. It also enhances uh, the LPS-mediated release of cytokines, so you get a lot of inflammatory damage. And uh, the E. coli at 157H7 also is responsible for a disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, where it causes uh, damage to blood vessels in the kidneys. Anthrax toxins are produced by Bacillus anthracis, the bacterium that causes anthrax. Uh, and there are two A components, a lethal factor and an edema factor. They both bind to the same binding portion called protective antigen. Now the lethal factor is the worst of the two as the name might imply. It's a protease uh, that at low levels inhibits the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, and nitrous oxide. And so that might initially, by preventing the release of beneficial pro-inflammatory cytokines, reduce immune responses against the organism and its toxins. But then at high levels, the lethal factor is cytolytic for macrophages, causing them to release all the various inflammatory cytokines they're making inside the cell. And the excessive release of cytokines by the macrophages leads to massive inflammatory response, 
which can trigger the shock cascade or SIRS, similar to what happens to septic shock when you have excessive amounts of PAMPs binding to PRRs leading to excessive cytokine production. So that too can trigger the shock cascade. Uh, the DEMA factor generates cyclic AMP in host cells. It impairs phagocytosis and inhibits the production of uh, certain inflammatory cytokines, which impairs host defenses. And we have two highlighted bacteria here, Corynebacterium diphtheriae and Bacillus anthracis. There's other toxins that uh, cause damage by interfering with host cell function, although they may not uh, be by ADP ribosylation. The botulinal exotoxin is produced by Clostridium botulinum, an anaerobic endospore producer. So remember this bacterium uh, lives in the GI tract often of grazing animals. Endospores then leave the animal through defecation and survive indefinitely in the soil because of course this is an obligate anaerobe and the soil has oxygen. So the endospores survive. Uh, as vegetables grow up through the ground, they pick up endospores. And if not properly treated, if a pressure canner is not used, remember boiling won't kill the endospores. So if the food being canned is simply boiled, that doesn't kill the endospores. And once the jar is sealed and you have an anaerobic environment, the endospores germinate and then they begin to grow, the vegetative bacteria grow in the food, and at the neut neutral pH of the food, this bacterium secretes a, the neurotoxin, botulinal exotoxin. And this acts peripherally on the autonomic nervous system. Now we have to understand a little bit about how muscles contract. For muscle stimulation, acetylcholine is released from the neuromotor end plate of the neuron at the synapse, the gap between the neuron and the muscle to be stimulated. And so the acetylcholine uh, induces the contraction of the muscle fibers. So that's how our muscles contract. They require acetylcholine release um, from the neuron for that process to occur. The botulism exotoxin enters the presynaptic neuron and blocks the release of acetylcholine. So now the uh, uh, the neurons are not releasing acetylcholine, and without the acetylcholine, the muscles don't contract, so this causes what we call a flaccid paralysis. And a flaccid paralysis is a weakening of the involved muscles. The muscles don't contract or barely contract. And death is usually from respiratory failure when eventually the toxin affects respiratory muscles like the diaphragm and the intercostals, uh, preventing their contraction. Uh, some of the cl Clostridium botulinum exotoxins cause ADP ribosylation. Some of them don't. There's a number of different types of botulinal exotoxin. But this causes a weakening of the muscle. And in fact, sometimes we use the botulism exotoxin therapeutically to treat certain neurologic disorders, like dystonias, a chronic disease uh, where you have involuntary contraction of muscles, uh, such as a person that has cross eyes or ecclesia is a failure to relax smooth muscle fibers like those in the larynx or the esophagus. So by injecting uh, dilute botulinal exotoxin into these muscles, that prevents these muscles from contracting and eliminates the symptoms of the dystonia or the uh, achalasia. Uh, there's a little GIF animation here showing how acetylcholine induces contraction of muscles. So the neuron at the motor end plate releases acetylcholine that binds to acetylcholine receptors, and that leads to muscle contraction. So every time our muscles contract, this is the process that stimulates those muscles to contract. And this is the action of the botulism exotoxin. So the botulism exotoxin um, enters the neuron at the synapse and prevents the release of acetylcholine. And if acetylcholine is not released, then the muscles don't contract. The tetanus exotoxin, also known as tetanospasmin, is produced by Clostridium tetani. And again, this is an obligate anaerobe that gives it, lives in the intestinal tract, often grazing animals. 
endospores get in the soil. And when a person gets an anaerobic wound, a deep puncture wound that closes up and has dead tissue in it, or any serious tissue injury with a lot of dead tissue, that provides the anaerobic environment and the right nutrients for the endospores to germinate and the vegetative clostridium tetani to begin to grow. And as the bacteria grow, they produce a neurotoxin, but this neurotoxin binds to inhibitory interneurons of the spinal cord and blocks the release of inhibitor molecules. Now it's these inhibitor molecules from inhibitory interneurons that eventually allow contracted muscles to relax by stopping the excitatory neurons uh, that release acetylcholine. So it's these inhibitors released by inhibitory interneurons that eventually prevent the uh, motor neurons from releasing, uh, releasing acetylcholine and that's how the muscles stop contracting. So by blocking release of inhibitors, this keeps the involved muscles in a state of contraction. They contract, they don't relax, and we call that a spastic paralysis rather than a flaccid paralysis. So in botulism with the flaccid paralysis, the muscles barely contract. With the spastic paralysis uh, of tetanus, the muscles remain contracted. And eventually opposing extensor and flexor muscles contract and the muscles all become rigid and death again is usually due to respiratory failure uh, from a continued state of contraction of the respiratory muscles. So this is another one we prevent with immunization. The T part of the DTP vaccine is the tetanus toxoid. So again, that's a harmless form of the exotoxin that stimulates the body to make neutralizing antibodies against the binding component of the, in this case, of the tetanus toxin. And also the diphtheria toxin in the D part of the DTP vaccine. And once the antibody binds to the toxin, the toxin can no longer bind to receptors on host cell membranes. Uh, so this just animation shows you um, how the inhibitory interneurons work. So again, the acetylcholine release from the motor neurons binds to receptors causing muscles to contract. Inhibitory interneurons produce inhibitors that eventually stop the motor neuron from releasing acetylcholine. And when the acetylcholine is no longer released, the muscle relaxes. So it takes these two nerves for the muscles to contract and then to relax. And again, this exotoxin, the clostridium tetani exotoxin, blocks release of the inhibitory molecules from the inhibitory interneuron. So if inhibitory proteins are not made, the motor neuron just keeps secreting acetylcholine and the muscles stay in a contracted state. They don't relax, and that's a spastic paralysis. Uh, neutrophil activating protein produced by the ulcer bacterium, Helicobacter pylori. Uh, this promotes the adhesion of human neutrophils to endothelial cells and the production of reaction, reactive oxygen radicals that we use to kill bacteria. So the toxin induces a moderate inflammation that promotes growth of Helicobacter pylori uh, and uh, allowing the bacterium to survive rather than being removed by the neutrophils. So those are some of the type three toxins and all of those interfered with some host cell function. And again, we have a little self quiz at the end you can do.